let's, we're going to bounce around a little bit. I, I, obviously, we're going to talk about worship. Um, but here's what I want to do. I want you to go to Psalms 8. And uh, I, I usually pick a text and then work on that for a bit uh, when I teach in the school. But I'm not going to today. I'm going to bounce around a bit. And this is the first school in a long time. I, will, I actually will be back on Friday, so I get to do more than one session, which is nice. I, I, this time of year is usually a time where I'm traveling. And uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm happy, happy about that. Uh, turn to Psalms 8, but also turn to Matthew 21, because I want you to see these two passages together. Matthew 21 is where Jesus actually quotes this psalm. And uh, that's what I'm wanting, wanting you to see. All right? Psalms 8 is where we'll read verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy of the avenger, and the avenger. All right, look at it again. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Jesus quoted this passage in Matthew 21, but I want you to hear how he quoted it. <clears throat> he said in verse 16, he said, uh, do you hear what these are saying? <clears throat> and Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise? In Psalms 2, he says, you have ordained strength. In Matthew 21, he says, you've perfected praise. Jesus either misquoted the Bible, which is hard for him to do since he is the word. <laughs> it's hard for God to not have something to say. He is the word. Jesus either misquoted the Bible or he gave us an insight as to what the psalmist was writing about when he said that... Um, uh, children uh, out of the mouth of babes, they've ordained strength. Here's what I want you to see as we, get, uh, as we get going this morning. Out of the mouth of babes, praise is perfected according to Jesus in, Psalms 20, or in Matthew 21. When he says that praise is perfected, another translation says established. Here's, here's what I want to do. This word praise in Matthew 21 is actually a word that means story. And so when you see strength, Psalms uh, 8 says strength, Psalms, uh, Matthew 21, I'll get it right. Matthew 21 says establish strength. He is interpreting the fact that praise is the way to personal strength. But the word used in Matthew 21 is a word that actually means story. And so in New Testament worship, we are actually unpacking the complete story of God's goodness in decrees. It's a story. It's as though you were sitting down with children and you were telling them the story of your vacation or, or when, where you were born or some experience you had in high school or whatever it might be, but it's unpacking the story. At one point, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says in chapter three, he's got this dialogue going with him about being born again. And he says, we speak, he's talking about the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He's not talking about him and the angels. If you read the context, they don't, no one has a clue what's going on but God. He says, we speak what we know, we testify what we have seen, but no one receives our witness. What is he saying? He's saying, we have stories to tell you, but people don't seem to be interested in the stories. What stories? The stories of God. I don't know if this uh, strikes up any curiosity in you, but I want to know how the Holy Spirit was released from heaven. The Bible says the highways to Zion, the highways to heaven built in praise, how the Holy Spirit came and invaded 120 people in an upper room and took the ordinary and made them extraordinary, touched them with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. I wanna know how that happened. I wanna hear the story. 
I remember when my, uh, my grandparents were still alive and my parents, they would tell us family stories. I, I love to hunt and fish, so uh, that's just a part of my divine call. I, I, I send animals to meet Jesus. And, and they contribute to my own personal health and strength. I, I caught some black snapper this week that we will be eating very soon. Anyway, I love to hunt and fish. And so when my grandparents uh, were alive, they would tell us stories, stories about when they were raised and their hunting dog and their, you know, the activities in the snow. And I just love to hear the family stories. And we have family stories and they go back throughout all of eternity. And the father's looking for someone to tell the story to. Those stories must be proclaimed, they must be declared, they must have songs written about. We need more songs about the actual nature of God, the person of God, the presence of God. This light is traveling uh, real fast (laughs) from the light bulb to the stage. Jesus is the expression of the light of the Father. He is, he is that which came from the Father and is the expression, the manifest expression of the Father. He's the exact image of the Heavenly Father. And the beauty and the splendor, his beauty is beyond all measurement in beauty. His wonder is beyond and above all wonders. His glory exceeds every ability that we might have to perceive and comprehend glory. This is who he is, and this one becomes manifest upon people that recognize him. The Bible says we magnify the Lord. How many know magnify means to make big? You can't make him any bigger than he is. So how can you actually magnify the Lord? In the sense of making bigger, you can't make God any bigger. What happens, however, is that as we give God praise and we magnify him, he becomes bigger in our circumstances, in in the situations of our own life. Through decree, see nothing happens in the kingdom until first there's a declaration. Praise is that decree that invites him to come and do what might otherwise not be done. People sometimes get a little irritated at, uh, at, at me, I don't know why, but it happens now and then. And, uh, and they don't like um, uh, messing with the subject of the sovereignty of God. Um, uh, for example, let me just mess with you a little bit. Um, how many you know God is in charge of everything? Do you think God is in control of everything? Every parent should know the answer to this one. You're in charge. But because there's free will in your house, you're not in control. Not every decision that's made is made according to your desire. Yes? All right. We sing about God being in control, but actually he created us with a free will and gave us a measure of choice. What is the will of God in the earth? One of the things that is the will of God is that it would become here as it is in heaven. And so we sing that, we pray it, we contend for it. What else? God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Is anyone perishing? Yes. Is that his will? No. When we talk about our influence, it's not in violation of the sovereignty of God. God in his sovereign plan wrote your role as a place of influence in unfolding his sovereign plan. Do you know that if we don't preach the gospel, Jesus isn't coming back to do it? There isn't a plan B. There isn't a plan B. When he passed the baton to the church and he says, all right, I'm the light of the world. And then he says, all right, now you're the light of the world. He was actually passing off a responsibility that he refused to come and reclaim. When he told the disciples to, um, they had a crowd in front of them, they've only got a boy's lunch, they have no way to feed the crowd, there's no food anywhere except a boy's lunch, Jesus said to them, you feed them. And when they were dumbfounded as to how that could even be possible, Jesus didn't change the assignment. 
Instead, he showed them how to do what was impossible to do. Sometimes when you're willing to do what you're not qualified to do, that's what qualifies you. The impossible is at the fingertips of those who say yes to anything God commands because in the command is the ability to do what he said to do. The word of God is a creative force. He spoke the worlds into being. So whenever he speaks to you, he creates capacity. I suppose if I could choose one thing that I would want everyone in this room to leave with at the end of however long the school is, sorry, I don't know. I know it's more than a day. <laughs> if there were one thing I could choose, I, th I think the thing I would choose is that everybody in this room, your ability and passion to hear the voice of God would multiply many, many times over. Because the scripture says, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Our life is in his voice. Our life is in his voice. When he speaks, there's this, how, how many remember this verse, a nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing. That word nothing is actually two words. It's the word no, and it's the word rhema, rhema, which is interpreted word. It implies, the word rhema often implies a freshly spoken word of God. In other words, that which, not which is written, but that which has been freshly spoken by the Lord. I mean, he can take what is written and freshly breathe that into your life, all right? So when he speaks to us, it never contradicts what's written. All right, so nothing is impossible with God. Nothing, no thing, no freshly spoken word of God will be impossible. Without, impossible means without ability. So here's how one way that that verse can be translated. No freshly spoken word of God will ever come to you that does not contain its own ability to perform itself. No freshly spoken word of God will ever come to you that does not contain its own ability to perform itself. The ability for the miraculous is in the seed, in the word that God has spoken to us. And so hearing from the Lord as we sing, as we worship in the preaching, in the one-on-one -on -one conversation, all of us have this ability to hear from God and to repeat what he says. More and more, you watch over the next 10 years, more and more, uh, some of the most extraordinary miracles we will ever see will actually take place during worship times when decrees are made by those who are speaking or those who are singing, those who are leading in song. A decree will be made and miracles will be released. Not to manipulate, not to cause in the sense that we want to force something to happen, but to hear the heartbeat of God to hear his heartbeat, to hear what he, what he longs to do, what he has such a passion to do, what Jesus has paid the price to accomplish. And when we see this thing released over congregations, you will see extraordinary things happen. We've had this happen for years, but it happens at a small, a real small uh, level. Uh, I, I do remember one Sunday, we had two people over here with broken, they had both uh, had uh, problems in their bodies because of broken necks. And they both came to me separately uh, before, uh, at the end of the meeting, I was at the back door, and they told me their story. They were healed during worship of the severe uh, uh, problems that they faced because of broken necks. When did it happen? It happened during worship. Uh, we, we have these things happen. Uh, we had a gentleman uh, visiting us, sitting right in the back here from uh, visiting from the UK. And uh, he, he came just kind of, uh, not really to receive, but more to examine, to kind of check things out. And he was encouraged to do it, so he said, all right, I'll go. So he came, and he had uh, just uh, sold all of his sporting equipment, anything to do. He was very active with kayaking and, and all kinds of outdoor sports, but he had such a severe injury of his shoulder that couldn't be repaired, spent all this money on, on uh, I, I think there, I don't know if there was multiple surgeries, what there was, but anyway, they, just, they finally came to the conclusion he's gonna have to live with this injury. And he sat right in the back, and during the worship, he's just kind of looking around, and then he got really ticked off because somebody spilled coffee all over his shoulder, and he turned around to express himself himself and there was nobody there and then he realized that that heat that went all over his arm was not coffee but was actually the fire of God and he was 
just, it was during worship. And these things happen, but I'm telling you, I feel like they're going to multiply. But they're not multiplying because we're targeting the miraculous. They are multiplying because we're targeting giving glory to the one who is worth, worthy of glory. And so here Jesus says, the psalmist says, I've ordained strength. Jesus says that strength is found in praise. It's found in telling the story of his goodness. Now listen, you cannot exaggerate the story of God's goodness. Try, you have permission from God to try the rest of your life to exaggerate his good. You can't exaggerate it. You can distort it, you can pervert it, you can misapply it, but you can't exaggerate it. It is absolutely beyond measure, his goodness. It's the cornerstone of all theology is the goodness of God. What did Jesus come to do? We know that he came to die. We know that he came to uh, destroy the works of the evil one. We know that he came to initiate a realization of the kingdom of God come to earth. We know that he came to do a number of things, and you go through the scriptures. We know that he came to reveal the name of the Father, that's in John 17. Are you guys alive? Everybody's still alive? We know that he came to do a number of things, but if you take everything that's on the list, reading through all of the New Testament that describes why he came, it all sums up in one phrase. He came to reveal the Father. Why? Because we live on a planet of orphans. And he came to reveal the Father. And your job and my job is to learn the story of his goodness. Put them into words. If they rhyme and they're worthy of a song, wonderful. If they don't rhyme, they're not worthy of a song, it's still needed to be declared. Don't do, don't do things for performance. Do things because they're right. Do things because they are true. You can sing a prophetic song that will never be repeated again. That's fine. Don't do something to market it. Do something because in the moment, it's alive. In the moment, it's alive. In the moment, the breath of God is on that phrase, on that statement, on that theme. And you just flow with that theme and you, 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 you lose track of, of what's going to be remembered and what's going to be recorded. That's, that is so not important in moments like that. I think, if we were, I think if we were willing to be less perfect, we'd become more perfect. I, I, think, if we're, I think, see, perf perfection is religion. Excellence is kingdom. And excellence is anchored in what's alive and what's true. And if we can anchor ourselves into the things that God is breathing on, we will end up with things that look very, very perfect. But we didn't get there because we were striving for perfection. We were striving for excellence. We, we were fighting, we were contending to illustrate who this father is to a planet of orphans. All right, now let's go to where I really wanted to go. Um, go with me to somewhere in the Bible. I want you to go with me to Psalms, uh, no, to Isaiah. Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60. Put a piece of paper there or something and then jump over to Psalms 102. A lot of what I'm going to try to address today will be covered, I'm, I'm sure, much more thorough by some of the others that will be spending time with you. But I, I, I wanted you to see something that just makes me so happy. Psalms 102. Verse 18. We'll, we'll go to Isaiah after this, all right? Psalms 102, verse 18. This will be written for a generation to come, that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. For he looked down from the height of his sanctuary from heaven to view the earth, to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to release those appointed to death to declare the name of the Lord in Zion, his praise in Jerusalem. Go back to verse 18, all right? This will be written for the generation to come that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. All right, stop right there. 
since the garden where Adam and Eve were created, there has never been a, another creation of humanity. Are you with me? This says a people yet to be created. He never came and recreated or, or, or created more people on the earth. There was Adam, there was Eve, and they reproduced. But this prophecy says there's going to be a people yet to be created that will praise the Lord. And the reason they will praise the Lord is because he looked from his height in heaven and he saw people bound in in prison. So somehow the release of prisoners is connected to the praise of God's people. Are you tracking with me? All right. So what's this created people? Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians 5.17, I think it's 5.17, where he says, you are a new creation. All things have passed away, all things have become new. How many remember that? It's the only time there has been a new creation. And in fact, the Bible declares that you as born again people are descendants of Abraham, but actually a new race. A chosen race, according to 1 Peter 2, 9, a chosen race, a royal people, a priesthood, a people for God's own possession, a new created group of people are the people sitting in this room, born again, born of the Spirit of God. The Bible calls a new creation. So here the psalmist is sitting hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and he sees something off into the future, and he prophesies in song. He says, what's about to be done is written for a generation to come, a people that aren't even created yet. He didn't say a people born, he said a people created. And he looked off into the future when there would be this experience where people would be actually born again of the Spirit of God into newness of life, where the resurrection power of Jesus that raised him from the dead moves into us, takes up residence within the physical being of every born again believer, making us new from the inside out. Not conforming from the outside in, but new from the inside out. Are, are you following me, all right? So he looks ahead and he sees this moment when there's going to be a new race of people on the earth. Now, lest you get any ideas about a superior race and that, that whole, don't go there. That's, that's the spirit of stupid. It's simply something that every human being is invited to come into through a, a rebirth experience. See, he looks at it and he says, a people yet to be created will praise the Lord. Why? He says in verse 19, for he looked down from heaven and he saw the groaning of the prisoner. Make the connection. There's going to be a people created and they're going to be created to praise. They're going to be created for the purpose of worship. Why? Because God looked down and he saw hearts in prison. Yeah. And he knew that this here would actually break this here. This should make you happy. Yeah. All right. Isaiah. Instead of 60, we'll go to 62. Verse 10. I'm making you work. And I'm not even sorry. I'm making you work today. You shouldn't have to work so hard on the first session, right? Oh, well. All right, verse 10. Go through, go through the gates Prepare the way for the people. Build up, build up the highway, take out the stones, lift up a banner for the peoples. Look at it again, verse 10. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people. Build up, build up the highway, take out the stones. Lift up a banner for the people. All right? Look in Isaiah 60, verse 19 or 18. And you will see what he was talking about when he said 
your gates. He says, verse 18, violence will no longer be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. All right? When you study the scripture, you've got to pay attention to the context. So what does he say in Isaiah 60, verse 2? He says, go through the gates. Only about 15 verses or so earlier, he tells us what the gates are. The gates are praise. I want you to see, I want you to visually see. You're artists, you should be able to see this. Go through the gates, clear the way for the people. Why? Because praise is a, is, is a is road building equipment. It removes obstacles between people and God that exist in the spirit realm. Build up the highway. What's a highway? It's a place of easy access. When there's, when there's no praise in a city, you watch. It's very difficult to pe get people saved. But when the church responds to the presence of the Lord and his greatness and declares his greatness, suddenly people start getting saved in great numbers. Why? Because things in the unseen have been dealt with. Now, in Revelation, it says that the gates are made of one solid pearl. The gates to the city of God are made of one solid pearl. How are pearls formed? Yeah, through irritation, right? Irritation. Anybody can praise when they won the World Cup or the Super Bowl or the Reader's Digest sweepstakes. But it's in, it's in the praise response in conflict in disappointment, in loss, that builds a gate. And what is the gate for? The gate is the place of entrance and access. Lift up your head, O ye gates, that the King of glory may come in. When my, my dad died about 10 years ago, he moved here to actually help, help us in revival. He was oh, just the most encouraging man I've ever met in my life. Much of our family was around his bedside when he took his last breath. He died of a disease that we see healed. There's confusion, there's pain, there's loss. There's all these things that I don't like. And that's, that's what defined that moment. I, I asked for the entire family to come and surround the bed. And we did several things. One of the things we did is my dad had, uh, he's the one who really uh, helped to bring breakthrough in, the, in our city many, many years ago in the area of worship. He had a very strong mantle in this area. And as a family, we just made a covenant to pick up that mantle that he had released to the family, to the church, and that we would we'd never drop it. So we made that covenant together first. Secondly, I determined to take what was painful and confusing to me. And if you can picture this, I'm going to offer God incense. And so I took pain and I put it in the fire of incense. And I took loss and I put it, I took confusion. I took guilt, all the stuff, and I let it flavor the fragrance of worship because I'll never have the chance to give him that same sacrifice in heaven because in heaven there's no loss there's no confusion there's no mystery there's no guilt none of that stuff I only, I only have this life this is my only opportunity to give him that prized offering the prized offering that comes out of just the brokenness of my own life and take all of that put it into that fire and then give him honor as the healer. Even though we didn't see the breakthrough we wanted to see. To give honor to God because he is so good to our family and has blessed us so much. And we just, and I, we as a family and individually continue just to pile on 
any confusion, any sense of loss, any sense of pain, just to put it in there and just to offer in, in spite of loss, in spite of all this that I don't understand and I can't control, to offer it up as an offering. Because I'll never have the chance to give him that gift in heaven. This is my only chance. And in the pain of that moment, to lose the greatest encouragement of my life is a very painful thing. The pain of that moment made that offering more valuable in his own nostrils, if you will. That's how gates are formed. They're formed in conflict. The conflict of thought that says, wait a minute, you didn't get the miracle that you, you cried out for. That's right, and God is still good. There's the conflict, and I give him praise. Yeah, but you, could have, you should have prayed this way or that way. You didn't, you, didn't pray, you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't do these things to get the breakthrough that you could. That's right. There's conflict. Uh, the, just the irritation of these things rubbing together is forming something in me because I'm, I'm determined to respond to him based on his goodness, not based on my, my experience, good or bad. And see, this says go through the gates. What are they? They're the gates of your own life where you have chosen to give him honor regardless. You form the gates. You create the gates by taking your moments, your moments of victory. If, your moments of victory. Celebrate the goodness of God. Make sure he gets all the credit for anything good that happens. I, I'm, 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 real, I'm real serious about this. If I'm looking for a parking place and I find one where I need it, I give him thanks. If I don't find one where, where I need it, I intentionally give him thanks that I have the privilege to walk and to get to where I need to go. I mean, the point is, it doesn't matter what happens, he's going to receive glory. He's going to receive honor. And what's happening is that throughout my life, throughout the last 45 years about, has been the forming of this gate. And this says, now go through these gates, continually go through these gates of praise, why? Because every time I do, I clear the way for people. Praise has become popular. And, and I'm, I don't feel bad about that. Praise has become excellent. Our musicians work hard. The music that they write, I mean, my goodness. You, you don't even have to be saved to enjoy. You can come in and just sit down and go, oh, this is just glorifying. We have, we have people that come in and say, oh, the vibe is so good. <laughs> All right, whatever works, whatever. <laughs> but the problem is, is the shift can move from the one who is wonderful to the artistic expression itself. Don't dumb down excellence. Just make sure you can worship when no one's watching. I don't want anyone leading us in worship that doesn't worship when they don't lead. You want big breakthroughs on the stage when you're leading the congregation, then get a breakthrough when you're by yourself. Get it when you're by yourself. That's when nobody's watching. There's something powerful about this passage here in Isaiah 62. Clear the way for the people. Go through, go through the gates. Prepare the way for the people. Build up. A New America Standard, I, said, I think, says clear the way for the people, if I remember right. Build up, build up the highway, take out the stones, lift up a banner over the peoples. I had a friend years ago, I, I didn't know him well, but he was a hero of mine. He, to be with him was honestly like being with the Apostle Paul. He was, he was just one of these giants of the faith that... Uh, you ever have those people that you admire so much they scare you to be with them but you, but you don't want to leave? Yeah, he's one of those guys. And he was a missionary and he was in, a, in uh, oh, Marshall Islands. And uh, he was challenged by some witch doctors one day. He says, can you do this? And he brought, they brought him over to a circle of men that began to chant 
and to chant and do this thing. And these dancing women came out of the hut in the middle of this circle of men. And they literally floated off the ground into the, into the air. They levitated off the ground. And the witch doctor leaned over to my friend and said, can you do this? And he said, no, but I can bring him down. <laughs> he said, no, you can't. He says, yep. And he just began to praise Jesus and <laughs> they came crashing to the ground. That's, that's just one of the coolest stories ever. <laughs> nope, but I can bring him down. <laughs> but here's, here's the deal. Worship, you know, is this extraordinary weapon of war. The Bible declares that. Declares praise as a weapon of war. Here's the fine line. When my reason for worship is warfare, it's no longer worship, it's flattery. In flattery, you do something nice because you want something back. And when we worship because we're looking for a certain result, let me try this side. (laughs) When we worship because we're looking for a certain result, we are doing nothing more than flattery. Worship is a response to worth. That's the nature of worship, is an acknowledgement of worth. If I'm in the biggest loss of my life or the biggest Uh, victory of my life, my response is according to his worth, because his worth remains the same. That's the reason I can praise in any situation. It's the reason I can bow low and worship and honestly be honest in my expression, excuse me, in my expression of exalting him. It's honest. It's, do you know that if I, if I worship only when I feel like it, that's not honest worship. Honest worship is when I do it based on who he is, not my own circumstances. People say, well, I don't want to lift my hands because I just don't feel like it. It wouldn't be genuine. Oh, it's, that's the perfect time to do it because that just shows you recognize who's Lord. You do it based on who he is, not based on how you feel. Amen, Bill. That's a very good point. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Why don't you stand? Let's sing that one. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strange. In the light of his glory and grace. Sing it again. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for in his wonderful face. And the thing. I give you my soul. I 
firstborn was just a few months old. He got real sick and he had this horribly high fever and it really scared us. And Benny and I were just really, it just scared us. And, you know, especially if you're firstborn, you don't, you don't even know how that little thing stays alive. You know, you're wondering like, how does it keep breathing? You know, you just, there's nothing you can do to make this thing work and it just works, you know. And, and, and he was at this horribly high fever, and I knew that praise was this powerful weapon. So I said, honey, let's go stand next to him. Let's just praise. And so we did, and I was praising because I wanted Eric to be healed. And in the middle of this performance of praise, I saw my heart that I was actually trying to manipulate God. It wasn't evil in the sense that it was outside of his will. It was in his purpose to heal. But I could see I was using the opportunity to honor him to get something. And I saw it. I said, oh, God, forgive me. And I just, I just broke. I just broke. And I, I made this commitment in my heart. I'm not even going to pray for my son. We'll just walk this thing out. And I just broke before the Lord. I said, oh, God, forgive me. I was exalting you because I was trying to get something. Forgive me for that. And as I began to repent and confess, this faith came on me for his healing. And all I can tell you is I had determined to not pray for him in one moment, and in the next moment, I was rebuking this, this, this affliction on his body. And it was, like, it was like the Lord was honoring this moment of brokenness because it's in our weakness that we're made strong. In, the, in, the, in that moment of just confessing, this anointing came on me, and I turned to my son, and I said, I rebuke this fever on my son. Within an hour, he was completely fine. Completely fine. The Lord... The Lord used that to help me to see he's not interested in flattery. He can create robots to do that. He's interested in the sacrifice of the heart, the yield is, yieldedness that just, and no matter what happens, I'm in a position to honor him because he's worthy, because he is worth the praise. He's worth the honor. He's worthy of the glory. Let's sing that last just a little bit again. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy. One last time. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You long, I long to worship. You long, I worthy of my praise. 
Lift up your praise. Bless the Lord.